Alrighty, good morning everyone. Welcome to Hillview. It's good to see you all here this morning. Um, if you're online and joining us, thank you for uh, for joining us um, and being part of our worship service. Uh, this morning, uh, it's it, we had the gem weekend this morning, uh, th this morning, this weekend, um, and it was g good to see some of you there. I was there on Friday. Um, I had the chance to meet uh, Dr. Ellen Effa, who uh, I think some of you, pro most of you probably know. Um, and uh, yeah, we have the pleasure of having him speak to us today about um, just missions and uh, the, the work of the Spirit in missions. So um, let's approach God this morning uh, through our call to worship. Um, and just, and after that, we'll pray to him and ask that he works in us today. So this is Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Lord God, this morning uh, you have brought us here to praise you as the one who has made the heavens and the earth we're here to celebrate your glory and strength, which are announced to us through your word and through this world that you have made. Um, and we have felt your faithfulness among us through the great things that you have done already. Uh, this morning, we want to pay special attention to the work that you are doing ar around the world. And we ask that you would allow us to proclaim your name in a way that honors you uh, to the nations. Uh, as the psalmist writes, uh, may we say this morning that the Lord reigns, and uh, let that be our prayer. Um, we pray this in your name. Amen. So we're uh, going to sing some songs of praise this morning. I would ask that you would stand with us as we sing. name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all Chosen seed of Israel's race, he ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord. On this terrestrial ball To him all majesty ascribe And crown him Lord of all To him all majesty 
majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall will join the everlasting song and crown him lord of all will join the everlasting song and crown him lord of tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise the glories of my God and King the triumphs of His grace we'll sing that again oh for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad, the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free His blood can make the foulest clean His blood availed for me And listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Glory to God and praise and love, he ever, ever give. By saints below and saints above, the church and earth and heaven. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Proclaiming news of happiness 
our God reigns. 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 He had no stay. that we should be drawn to Him. He was despised and we took no account of Him. Yet now we reigns with the Most High. Our God Pastor Herman is not able to be with us this morning. Ironically, some medication and medical treatment he received to make him better has, on one hand, made him worse. And um, we just want to be praying for, uh, for Herman today and throughout the week and the weeks to come. Um, please, uh, please make uh, Pastor Herman a priority on your prayer list. Uh, he's quite weak and, and has been for the last week or so. Um, so I will be reading the Old Testament uh, and uh, offering the, uh, the pastoral prayer this morning. So if you would uh, join with me as we consider these words from the scroll of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So far, the reading of God's word. We are going to pray in just a moment. I would, uh, I would like to direct your attention to the bulletin, and you'll notice that uh, our missionary of the week are the, the Bardens, Rick and Debbie, as they're serving in Cameroon at the hospital. The Church of the Week is Parkland Baptist out in Spruce Grove, Pastor Josh and his wife Karen. I don't know why they never list the other pastoral staff, but there's a youth pastor there, Enoch, and uh, uh, his family, and uh, for all who serve there. Our family of the week are Derek and Crystal O'Neill. Derek left his job as a crane operator in Fort McMurray and has gone back to trucking, and so he is, uh, he's in New Brunswick this morning, but we want to be praying for them. And... Um, and then we have some other folks that we want to be praying for today. And, um, and I will be offering a prayer for our missionaries. When I'm finished praying, Ardith Effa is going to play some, a special piece of music that she has compiled. And as she is playing, there will be a series of slides that you will see which will direct you to pray for specific missionaries, those whom I will be praying for. If you would like a list, a printed list, we can, we can make that for you and get it to you either electronically or have it for you next week. But this weekend was the GEM weekend, Greater Edmonton Missions Conference. And I, uh, I just want to express a word of thanks to all the people from Hillview who came out, uh, some for the passion and the, the joy of supporting missions, and some had extra reasons. I mean, one of our congregants is actually related to the director of Gateway, and uh, um, so Irene, it was just a blessing to see you there with your family. Um, but... Um, we had, a, we had a great turnout from this church, and, uh, and I'm just so grateful that, uh, that people came out to hear. We, uh, we seem to be losing traction, but I think we can turn that around simply by talking to our friends and our neighbors, and perhaps you have influence in some of your social circles with people who might be attending other churches. But next year, the GEM event will be held at McKernan. And I think it would just be great if we could spend 12 months just talking about the importance of missions. Um, again, a huge thank you to those of you who came. And as a side note, you might remember that the Greater Edmonton's Missions Conference started right here in 2016. Or was it 2015? Before I was the pastor, so I think it was 2015. If it was October, it was 2015. I even think I sat with Deke Kling, Klingbeil. Didn't we sit together that day? Yes, we did. Um, and something special happened that night. Over $20,000 was raised for missions. We, uh, we are the North American Baptist Conference. And when it comes to missions, we are very good at it. Let's not let that slide. Let's pray. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
God without beginning and God without end, eternal, sovereign, holy, just, and you are love. On this of all weekends, we recognize, Father, that you sent your Son because of your great love for us, for the world. You sent us a Savior. You sent us your Son to seek and save the lost. And of this we are mindful and grateful. And we would ask that you would search our hearts and know us that you would forgive us of our sin, of our iniquities. Father, even for those sins of apathy, lethargy, that perhaps we have lost our passion for the lost. O holy God, ignite in us anew and afresh that fire which burns so passionately in you that none would perish but that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ to be immersed in the love of God to be saved from the penalty of sin and the eternal condemnation of death Holy God, make us mindful of that which is important to you. Lord, we think of our missionaries who serve you so faithfully. We think of the Bardens and we pray that you would send people this day to encourage them, support them, provide for them in whatever way they might need. Give them strength, safety, the ability to endure any suffering which may beset them. Lord, we pray this also for Josh and Karen and Enoch and his family and for all who serve you at Parkland. For even as that church seeks to be a light in that neighborhood, I pray that you would give the leadership great wisdom in knowing how to witness and minister to that community for the greater glory of God. I pray for Derek and Crystal and I pray that you would bless and protect their marriage and their children pray that you would keep them safe at work and at home. Lord, from all that seeks to pull them asunder, Lord, I pray that you would protect them and guide them and give them the grace that they would need to continually declare your praise. Father, we think of the missionaries that we support here at this church. Lord, we, we lift up the Kilmartins and pray your blessing over Jeff and Sonia. And Lord, uh, you know far more than I do what they need. But I would pray that you would send your angels to protect them and encamp about them and keep them safe from hostile forces. Lord, uh, watch over their family. Pray for the Garings as they serve you and pray that you would give them insight and understanding as they translate the scriptures. Pray for Lindell and Paulo that you would meet their health needs but also continue to bless the ministry at the seminary. Lift up Nathan and Aaron before you and pray for health and... Um, Lord, all the incredible things that Nathan's doing at the schools in Moose Jaw and the impact that he's having with leaders in that community, watch over him, Lord. Keep him, keep him well. I don't know anybody who's gotten as sick as, as, and as often as he does, but have your hand upon him. Lord, we think of Taylor and ask your blessing over the seminary, David Williams, the faculty, the staff. Lord, I want to thank you for Harry Kelm and uh, the leadership he's providing and uh, for all who serve at the NAB. Well, I guess there's no headquarters anymore, but for Carrie and Stu and Cam and for all who are serving you there. 
And Lord, for our own ABA, pray your blessing over Terry as he continues to rest for Matt, for Andrea. Lord, we are stronger together, so give us a vision for what we can do collectively. Lord, um, we are just mindful of what a great gift it is to be able to come before the sovereign God of the universe and lay our requests before you with the confidence that you hear and receive what, what we bring. And Lord, as we pray in accordance to your will and with your will, we believe that you will do this and abundantly more than what, whatever we ask. So God, um, unfurl your majesty. And Lord, may the nations, all of them, declare how great is our God. Father, I offer you this prayer in Jesus' name as we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Mrs. Effa.
Our New Testament reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So far, the reading of God's word. Well, it is, it is, it is so cliche to say, it's my great honor to introduce today, but it is my great honor to introduce today our speaker, um, the, uh, the son of Herman and Ardeth Effa, Alan Effa, brother to Gerilyn. It was 24 years ago this fall, family to Edmonton, Alberta, to study at NABC, because uh, Terry Fawson convinced me that it was, it was a good school and, and I could do this. And I wasn't sure because I hadn't been in school for about 10 years and, and, uh, and I, I applied. I don't know how many people know this, but uh, my previous academic performance was a little on the unsatisfactory side. I know this because they accepted me conditionally. I was put on academic probation before I even started. And uh, I'm completely intimidated. I'm 29 years old and um, surrounded by a bunch of 18 year olds and, and the course is introduction to missions. And uh, this guy up at the front of the room, he's all passionate and emotional and touchy-feely and I'm a railroader I'm thinking who is this I don't know about this I don't know what to do and and he keeps talking and uh, we have a few more classes and I don't know how it all comes about but he is passionate about Muslim people so I in my infinite wisdom decided to explain to him in front of everybody that I had no real and he looked me square in the eye and he said I don't think you're much of a Christian <laughs> he did he said that to me <laughs> And you know what? I'm grateful you did. Because it made me rethink everything. It made me rethink that whole concept of cultural Christianity versus biblical Christianity. About the value of human souls. About what it means to go. Interestingly enough, the last course I took at Taylor Seminary to finish my master's degree was called Theology of Mission with the same professor. A 20 page paper on the motif of suffering and missions, where I came to a very clear understanding that if I was gonna communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ at home or abroad or both, that it would entail suffering. And that wherever the gospel goes, people suffer. But if you were to ask me my three top memories of Alan Effa through those years. Number three would be when I considered exercising, but one day saw him hobble in on crutches and a cast because he had done something horrific. I couldn't really discern if it was just midlife crisis or exercise or both, but I knew that I should avoid exercise at that point. The... Uh, the next two memories kind of, I can't rate. I have shared with many of you the, the beginning of our daughter's life was fraught with many uh, travails. And I was completely lost. In fact, I was at the college to, to quit. 
classroom, and I saw my daughter's name up on the board, and he had his class praying for my daughter. The other one was when I was finishing everything and wondering if the last two years had just been a colossal waste of time because I had way, way more railroad in me than church. And, uh, and I stopped in your office. And I asked you one day, as everything was coming to a conclusion, if you thought that maybe I should continue or if I should just... And I don't know if you remember this, but you looked at me and you said, you have way more to offer the kingdom of God than switching boxcars. I believed you. Wasn't sure, <laughs> but I believed you enough that I kept going. And, uh, yeah, here we are. Hey, a couple decades later. I don't know if I'd be here without you. So it is my great honor and privilege to introduce you to my church. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Alan Effa. I don't think I've quite had an introduction like that before. It's, what a great trip down memory lane. Some great times together. Sometimes as professors you see students come and go and you wonder, does it make any difference? I look back up my transcript from seminary. There are courses I took that I can't remember even being in the classroom for, <laughs> quite honestly. But every bit has its impact. Every seed somehow is sown. And, it produces its fruit in its time, and that's the work of the mysterious work of the Spirit. So thank you for inviting me. Last time I spoke here was when Marty Wagenthal was your pastor. So, and of course, the color of the pews was very different, which I think is a pretty recent innovation. So thank you so much. When you get invited back, it's kind of a nice pat on the back that you did okay. <laughs> and I appreciate being able to join with you. I come today wearing the hat of Friends of the Fulbe Society, or the New Dawn Initiative, not so much as a professor from Taylor, although I'll be speaking on mission, but as a representative of this society that works alongside with Jeff and Sonia Kilmartin and with this Least Reach People Group. I want to thank you as a congregation the Kilmartins, for New Dawn Initiative, for the individuals among you who have continued to support the projects of education, evangelism, and community development which are going on through the ministry of these national leaders who are passionate for God, who are seeking to reach their own people, and a people group that is 99.5% Muslim. So very challenging, but we're just seeing God do some fantastic things among them. I'll be sharing some of those things as we talk about John chapter 20. Now you might be wondering why I'm speaking on an Easter passage of scripture. I try to make some kind of connection. Well, a dead person does show up in their room. <laughs> kind of a spooky story, really. But it's a story about mission and Jesus commissioning his disciples. John lumps together the resurrection, the Great Commission, and Pentecost all in one event on a Sunday evening in Jerusalem. And the disciples are meeting with, uh, with locked doors, huddled in fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus' death might also be hunting them down. Maybe they were also afraid that Jesus might show up. <laughs> they had just heard the news from Mary Magdalene that she had seen the Lord, and maybe they were a little bit scared that they might meet up with him after all that he had gone through, and they had miserably failed him in his time of greatest need. But there they are, afraid. I wonder what they were talking about when they huddled together in that room. Maybe their exit plan, how to get safely out of Jerusalem back to Galilee. Maybe what's the next step in terms of their career. The great moments they had with Jesus. And then Jesus comes and stands among them and says, peace be with you. Whoa, 
How did he get in that room anyway? Did the doors just fling open and he walked in? Did he materialize like a Star Trek transporter and show up in the midst of them? Whatever mode, he wanted to make sure the barriers between himself and the disciples were minimized and he could encounter them. And his first words are, peace be with you. Hebrew greeting, whenever you walked into someone's household, you would say, Shalom Aleichem. Or as the Arabic peoples around the world say, Salam Aleikum. May peace be upon you, plural you, upon this household. He says it twice. The first time, I think, is just to break the silence and to assure them that he's alive, that's not a ghost, that he's there in the flesh. But the second time, he says, peace be with you. It's part of his sending words as he's sending his disciples out, as, as in the, giving them their, their, their marching. Embedded in these few crucial words is our operating manual for mission that transcends all times and cultures. Jesus affirms his way of doing mission as a template for how his disciples are to continue that mission. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Ten of the most profound and powerful words in the New Testament. Words that we need to go back to the drawing board on from time to time because we all stray from doing mission in the way of Jesus. In fact, I would say if only we had kept the pattern of Jesus, we would have avoided an awful lot of messy stuff that we have done as a church in the name of Jesus. In this brief passage, we find three timeless marks of mission that emerge from the example of Jesus. And I'm really bad at alliteration, but they actually all start with S. It just happens to be shalom, scars, and spirit. So let me talk about mission must be done as an expression of Shalom. This gospel of the kingdom embraces the total well-being of people and their society. Jesus did not get crucified because he was telling people how to get right with God so they can go to heaven when they die. That doesn't get anybody into trouble. He was preaching this radical good news of the kingdom that invites the poor, the dispossessed, those who are at the margins of society into the fellowship of a new order of, of living that John characterizes as abundant life. Restored relationships, dignity and healing and justice for the poor and the oppressed. Jesus turns the tables of society upside down by welcoming and including those people that the religious leaders consider to be impure and unworthy and unclean. In fact, he turned the purity laws upside down because the religious leaders thought you have to avoid touching this or touching that or touching those kind of people or being close to those kinds of people that contaminate you. And Jesus saw things in a complete reversal. Instead of contaminating him, he touched the leper and the woman with the issue of blood and the man living among the tombs. And he saw that the goodness and graciousness and holiness of God went the other way and flowed out toward those people and made them well and made them whole again. Jesus redefined the boundaries of who was in and out and often he made the point that the religious leaders were on the outside and not the inside. That's so much. This shalom extends even to the integrity of creation and the preservation of all creatures. Shalom is the hope and the goal of mission. I've read it in the back of the book. That's where we're heading. 
And our partnership with New Dawn Initiative in Cameroon and Nigeria places a high value on seeing God's shalom established. Along with supporting evangelists and training church leaders, our ministry partners are involved in helping villages secure clean and providing homes and food for orphans and widows, establishing a clinic to care for the sick and to prevent diseases. This, too, is the work of mission. Our brothers and sisters live in a country that is so deeply divided ethnically and religiously that there's a huge polarization. And because our partners come from Muslim backgrounds, they face some significant opposition and boycotts. And despite the pressures, one of their most recent initiatives, I shared this yesterday at JAM, is that our leaders want to meet all kinds of boycotts and inflammatory talk about them, meet them face to face, to dialogue with them, to build relationships with them, to get to know them as individuals, share hospitality. In fact, I just got a, a, a text from jo Jeff during the night, Jeff Kilmartin. I think some of you got his newsletter yesterday, uh, a couple of days ago about Suleimano, one of the Christian leaders who was under attack by his clan. Well, his clan sent seven people to talk with him and deal with him. And you know what he did? He fed them breakfast. He fed his while I was sleeping. He was this morning, or I guess it would have been Sunday, Sunday morning. He, he offered them breakfast and they returned back to their homes. They had come to consider how they were going to deal with him. This kind of building of friendship and peace is desperately needed in communities all over the nation. But after his first greeting of peace, Jesus stretches out his hands and shows them his scars and lifted up his tunic to expose the wound in his side. Now, of course, it was a way to assure them that he really was Jesus. Because there's been different appearances and people can't quite make him out right away. But it was more than just a self-identification. As he was commissioning them into mission, he reminded them of his scars. He who rejected the use of power and coercion became the victim of violence and suffering. Back to your term paper. <laughs> Mission in the way of suffering. Mission in the way of Jesus is humble, costly, and sacrificial. Brokenness, not success. Faithfulness in this new order of the kingdom of God. It's not a pattern that we have become accustomed to in the many centuries of church history under Christendom. When the church has exercised power to enslave Africans, to wipe out cultures and languages of indigenous peoples, the church has allied itself with right-wing military dictators in Latin America who suppressed freedom of speech and prohibited labor unions from organizing and calling out for better working conditions for their The legacy of thousands of indigenous children buried in unmarked graves on church-owned property in this country, and the more than 200,000 children abused sexually by French priests, is not mission in the way of Jesus. And we bear the scars as a church community. We bear the scars today, not the scars of innocent suffering, but the scars of shame and regret and the loss to the world. And our posture must be one of repentance and humility, of genuinely seeking reconciliation. Congregations across Canada must address the evils we have done in the name of God. The TRC recommendations direct the churches to have a, a role in the healing of our nation. This is remarkable. 
Because most, most of secular Canadian society, the church has seen as completely irrelevant. But here is an in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to the churches to have a role in the healing of Canada. And what could be more biblical than the work of reconciliation? Which is actually a wrong term. There is no reconciliation because that rec, the R-E in the front means we used to be in good terms and now we're just going to return to good terms. It's actually conciliation. It's a whole new dimension of understanding. And yet when I ask my students how their congregations are responding to the recommendations of the TRC, I usually see blank the brothers and sisters we partner with, with New Dawn Initiative, have maintained a loving and faithful witness despite the scars of their suffering. A number of years ago, they came under attack by a, a rival ethnic group, and they had to leave their homes and their livestock, abandon everything, and go in complete destitute poverty to Cameroon, where they found refuge, and they received some aid through our uh, aid program. But they refused to take up arms. Since then, they have returned to their land and have developed a series of help our assistance to serve their own interests, but also the interests of their communities, even some of those very same people who rose up against them. Their medical clinic is there to serve anyone who comes to the door, even those who have been enemies of the way of Jesus. This past year has seen an increase in hostility and threats to this vulnerable group. But for the most part, they have remained steadfast in their suffering, pointing to the lamb with pierced hands and feet. Of God given to the church. Jesus doesn't just give them a pep talk and a little Four Steps to peace, and God, peace with God booklet to take with them on their mission. He breathes on them that same spirit which came upon Mary on her conception of Jesus. The same spirit that came upon Jesus at his baptism that empowered him for ministry. This spirit who blows here and there, sometimes in surprising and hidden ways, never predictable, certainly never manageable. And when you read the unfolding story, you don't see the disciples getting together and strategizing. Now let's see how we're going to take this gospel of the kingdom to Judea, to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Quite the contrary. They were not even sure how to accommodate Greek-speaking Jewish widows into their church. They were not cross-culturally aware. In fact, we see a great reluctance among the disciples to move outside of their cultural comfort zone. It's the Spirit who keeps breaking through with the Samaritan, with reluctant Peter and the house of Cornelius. It's a story of the Spirit moving ahead and the church trying to play catch up with the work of the Spirit. Not a whole lot of human ingenuity or planning. The emergence of the church among the Fulbe can only be explained as a work of the Spirit. My wife Karen and I were commissioned as NAB's first missionaries to the Fulbe back in 1986. Maybe some of you remember. We only got to spend a short time working with them because one of our colleagues was killed in a car accident and I had to assume her husband's duties as field director. We had gone out there with the prayers of God's people. I had taken several courses on Islam from the Samuel Zwamer Institute. We were learning the Fafuldi language. I could communicate fairly well already. We had literature to share with them. We prayed for their sick. My wife was a nurse. We cared for those who were ill. I fasted with them during Ramadan in their compounds and shared Christ with them. And express interest in following the way of Jesus. 
And a couple years later, we left heartbroken with a medical emergency, and we wondered if it was all in vain. And just a few years after we left, an apostle, prophet, charismatic, Fulbe Christian, I don't know how he became a Christian, rose up and began preaching to his people without financial support, without literature, without any Bible training, offering words of knowledge to people that came true, gathering people together to become little cells of prayer that saw Jesus as Lord and Savior. And now there are all these scattered little groups of Christian fellowships all around the Mambila Plateau. Ten years later, he was arrested and killed, just like he had prophesied. The people we partner with, New Dawn Initiative, are the fruit of that ministry. No missionaries were involved in birthing this movement. It's the work of the Spirit. Earlier this year, when social pressures on social media pressures were mounting against our believers, they were facing more and more dangers. A number of single young men decided to abandon their Christian faith and go back to their faith of their origins. One of the pressures was that in that small Christian community, it's very hard to find a wife. And the clerics had made a, a had made a, a, a command to all the Muslim people in that neighborhood, in that community, not to allow any of their daughters to be married to those concerned about that. The church was devastated. I mean, this was the future leaders that were now turning their backs on their faith. The Christians prayed, continued to reach out to them with love and compassion. And just a couple months ago, you probably read this in the newsletters, a good number of them came back in repentance and said, we want to seek the way of Jesus again. It made no sense from a social, economic, or political advantage point of view, but the Holy Spirit works convincing people of truth and righteousness. When we do mission in the power of the Spirit, we do not need to manipulate to coerce or force matters. We don't even need to fret about the future of the church. I share some of the great concern about the future of the church after COVID, whether we will see any of our young people even remain in the church after a generation or two. The vast majority of friends my age have seen their children abandon any kind of connection to the church. Many of our younger people see the church as an antiquated social network at best, or a deeply flawed institution at worst. I wonder how we will regain credibility in our Canadian society when the church is seen as tarnished by its misuse of power, patriarchy, homophobia, racist attitudes, and science deniers. Evangelical Christians in the US, white evangelical Christians, have the most negative view of immigrants of any people group in the US and are the strongest deniers of climate change. There are times I hang my head in shame and wonder if we have anything to say to our world. I've had to struggle this whole semester. I'm teaching a course on evangelism and church planting. What is our message of hope to the world? And then I return to this story and to the ancient purpose laid out in Jesus' words to those disheartened and disillusioned disciples. In that upper room on that Easter Sunday, they thought they were finished. They thought everything had ground to a halt. They thought there was no future for this kingdom dream that they had given the past three years of their lives to. And Jesus breathed the Spirit on them. He breathed new hope. 
As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The only way forward for the church in the West is to recapture mission in the way of Jesus. To be a people of shalom who genuinely seek the well-being of, our, of the marginalized, the oppressed, the refugee, those with disabilities, to offer a radical and warm welcome of hospitality to those who are on the outskirts of society, to be a people who advocate for peace with God, with themselves, with others, and with creation. To be a people of scars who offer a witness grounded in our humility and vulnerability who embrace the way of humble service and nonviolence and deep listening to those we have wronged, to the point of being willing to suffer alongside the victims in our society, to be a people of the Spirit, carried and moved by the mysterious power of the Spirit, who continually surprises us and renews and refreshes the whole created order. The Spirit of God is at work despite the lockdowns and the limitations on gatherings that are necessary. My 128-year-old congregation has seen several new families join us despite the fact that most of their contact was virtual. And today we're having a baptismal service. I'd like to see how they baptize with masks on. <laughs> And I, I was talking to Pastor Norm this weekend. He says, you have four candidates for baptism that are preparing for baptism. Who would have thought this spirit brings forth new expressions of life out of the ashes and the failures of our endeavors? We place our confidence in the spirit who is leading all history toward a day when all things will be brought under Jesus' feet and heaven and earth will be one. Let me pray. Friends at Hillview Baptist, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Risen Lord, you come in peace and give us the same spirit that empowered you in mission. Help us to stay true to that mission by being people of shalom, humble bearers of suffering love, carried along by the healing spirit who brings order out of chaos. That our skeptical and weary world might encounter your ageless message in fresh and compelling ways and know you the true source of life and beauty and goodness. We pray these things in the name of the community of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Um, let's uh, stand and we'll sing our uh, song of reflection here. There is a Redeemer. Jesus, my 
precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, for sinners slain. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I will see His face, and there I'll serve my King forever. giving us your son and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. Amen. And now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Before I bless you, I just want to say thank you so much for such a powerful message and for being with us today. If anybody would like to talk to you, will you be available? Um, thank you so much. And, um, and I forgot to mention this earlier. I just, I've been looking for him. I, I don't see him here. But uh, Connor Rudolph, uh, you all know Connor. He, uh, he, was, he was front and center this weekend with Jem. He... He did a whole bunch of interviews on Friday night, and he was helping throughout the day Saturday. Um, next time you get to see him, just uh, pat him on the back and encourage him. He's just, uh, just doing a great job, isn't he, Ben? He did well. I was really proud of him. Um, may God bless you and keep you as you go forth from this place. May he make his face to shine upon you. May his favor and blessing rest upon you and your household. And as you are filled by that Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the grave. Go forth and proclaim the gospel in shalom with scars in the power of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you all. Amen. <laughs>